Hello and welcome to Viewpoint. I'm joined today by Mikola Kapitanenko. He's a director at the study for the Centre of International Relations. Good morning. Mikola, many thanks for joining us. Uh, we just had, um, in recent days, the uh, French and German foreign ministers here in Kiev. Um, on the one hand, this looks like a show of support. Uh, on the other hand, it seemed like they were coming here just to check up and, and see if everything was, was OK. Um, perhaps they seem a little, a little worried with the instability in Ukraine at the moment. And what was your reaction to this? Well, they definitely are worried. And we should take this visit both as the sign of support and the checkout. So the task of the Europeans is somehow to minimize risks and damage caused by the Ukrainian crisis. So they're here and they're involved in mediation of the conflict for two years already, almost, with this aim in mind. So we, sh we shall take all the steps taken by the Europeans, yeah. uh, like in those leading to, to, the, to that aim, basically. Do you feel like they are getting somewhat frustrated? Um, as you said, they've been involved now for two years. Um, the conflict in eastern Ukraine is, is still going on. We haven't seen a lot of progress, we might argue. Now, there are two key problems with that. The first is about the Europeans themselves, because they don't seem to have any long-term strategy, um, be it uh, concerning Eastern European states overall, or Ukraine in particular, after the Maidan. And the second problem is certainly the lack of progress in Ukraine. We have to be in, become an effective state, basically, to become a solution rather than a problem. And uh, since this is not happening, there are doubts and fears and uh, shifting of positions uh, in different European countries uh, for the first, uh, most importantly, in uh, Germany and France. Do you feel like Europe's approach here is, is somehow flawed? I would say that uh, they're trying to build up uh, a somewhat medium strategy uh, which would help them stay away from extremes and risks. So this kind of inertial way of uh, approach uh, EU used to apply before to the security issues. But this is no longer working effectively because the whole security arrangements in uh, Eastern Europe has changed after the Russian annexation of the Crimea and applying of hard force in, in general. Mikola, we have seen over the last couple of years um, quite a lot of unity from the European Union in that they all came together uh, voting for these sanctions on Russia. Um, those are going to come up for renewal again um, in the summer. There are voices now in, in Europe saying that these won't be automatically extended as they were in the past. Um, it seems like Ukraine is under pressure here to show some progress because otherwise it's going to be harder and harder for these countries to you know, continue their, their support for this country. Um, what, what, what do you think is going to happen? I think that we will have um, more problems than before in... Um continuing the sanctions against Russia. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we have to understand that this is the real support from European side, something which we should not take for granted. This is something we have to respond with actively changing the country. On the other hand, from the very beginning when sanctions have been applied, uh, it was unclear strategically what would be the result, how the sanctions would actually work to make Russia change their stance. It is still unclear now. That is why there are voices within Europe that sanctions are actually useless. Well, they are punishing Russia a little bit, but they are not uh, making things way much different. Um, so do you think, in fact, actually more measures against Russia need to be taken? Um, I suppose the argument there would be that Ukraine's progress, Ukraine's ability to reform is, in fact, it's hindered, isn't it, by Russian aggression. So it's sort of like a, a chicken and an egg, isn't it? I mean, yeah, that's definitely. Where do we look? Down. Where do we look first? We have to understand that, that we are in the middle of uh, a very serious crisis. And even if Ukraine uh, becomes much more efficient and effective as a state, and do you think? Crisis... I mean, you think that is possible, even given the aggression that we have now in eastern Ukraine? The aggression the makes things more complicated, but still, it is possible. I think. But again, even if we have a much stronger Ukraine, uh, that won't end up a security crisis we are currently in. And Europeans are here as well. They are also in a completely reshaped uh, regional security environment. So that means that uh, they have to not only to address 
Ukraine, actually, not only to demand more reforms from Ukraine and to become more effective and things like that, but they also have to consider the long-lasting security arrangements in Europe. Yes. They, suddenly there must be some serious reaction to what Russia has done because it undermined the very basic principles and foundations of European security. So this is no, not only about Ukraine. This is a much more wide crisis. And what would that longer-term view look like, do you think? Um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with the conflict in Eastern Ukraine. It might just become another frozen conflict like we have in, in other parts of, of Europe. Um, if, if that is the case, what, what will happen? I mean, European Union can't simply cut off trade with, with Russia indefinitely, I would assume. Absolutely. No one can uh, afford himself to cut off trade with anybody in the globalized world. But the, the issue for the European Union here is, first of all, to develop a strategy that will include not only normative power, on which European Union used to rely, but also hard power elements should be introduced. New concept of uh, the role and place of NATO in European security should also be put forward. The European Union should develop the strategy towards Russia, actually, which was absent. It has also to reassess its European partnership project to probably to address countries of the project, target countries individually. However, even more changes should be introduced here. So there is a very complex, huge task for the European Union itself in order to keep uh, united in what concerns security issues. And, and this comes at a time, doesn't it, when the European Union is um, facing a lot of internal problems um, and it seems like this question, bigger questions of, of East European security, of, of Ukraine, of Russia, they're almost taking a back seat at the moment, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, that's right. The security area has always been a weak link in uh, EU's integration, deepening integration efforts. Yes. So there has been always lack of uh, unity among uh, major EU, most, most big uh, countries. And uh, now it's the moment when all these things coincided. I mean, hard security challenges from Russia as well as soft security threats from uh, refugees and social economic crisis and things like that. And this is a, a huge test for the European Union to show whether it is able to deal with security problems uh, as a union, not as a sum of uh, member states. Yes. Um, and do you hope that it, it does emerge from this, the, the stronger? Do you think that is what it is needed? I mean, it's interesting to think about this, especially in the context of Ukraine, where we had the Euromaidan revolution um, almost two years ago. I mean, people were holding European flags. People died, it would seem, for European values. So if the European Union does collapse, I mean, that's a huge blow for Ukraine as, as well, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I don't think it will collapse. Uh, the most um, probable negative consequences of this is uh, that the European Union would be unable to handle security issues, that it will uh, give it up to national levels and we will have uh, foreign policy and security policy of Great Britain, Germany, France being different with different emphasis. As concerns Ukrainians, uh, we must understand that... Uh, this is not actually European values we are fighting for. We are fighting for independence and sovereignty. European values, something like democracy, minority rights, uh, uh, the rule of law and things like that, uh, you don't have to fight for them, you don't have to die for them. This is something which is implemented in the political system, in the constitutional process and becomes a part of everyday life of the people. Uh, we, actually, what we are fighting for is uh, <clears throat> independence. This is a classical war for independence. And people should not take it uh, differently because it shifts emphasis and creates uh, false expectations. Mikhail, we're almost out of time, unfortunately. Um, finally, then, the European Union, um, it's been said it doesn't practice geopolitics. Um, is this something, then, ultimately, which, which needs to change for you? I think for... Since the very beginning of the crisis, my idea was that this is something they have to learn. They have to input a political dimension to their security policy, be it a, a, a policy of the Union or the sum of foreign and security policies of the member states. There certainly must be a geopolitical, geopolitical component because without it, it will be impossible to deal with Russia. And, and you think here in, in Ukraine that would, of course, be welcomed? Um, that certainly would be welcome, but um, I would probably 
pay more attention to the fact that uh, not always geopolitical compromise between great powers is a good thing for medium and small powers. Sometimes um, it, it can be achieved uh, uh, at the sake, uh, basically, of these uh, states. And unfortunately, European history shows lots of examples when countries located between Germany and Russia have become victims to geopolitical considerations of great states. Yes. So and this should be very carefully crafted, I would say. Is this, is this then the, the ultimate challenge for Ukraine, is to try to navigate this, this path between uh, you know, sovereignty, independence, yeah, moving well, towards Europe, but at the same time... Yeah, that has always been a very diff difficult task for Ukrainian foreign policy. And I think by now the most important component of this is to try to put forward uh, the Ukrainian vision of European security and Ukraine's place in it in order to become an effective contributor to collective uh, defence, not only the, a country which constantly demands attention and help. Yes, and, and we're still trying to work that out, I suppose, in Ukraine. Is that what this last two years, I mean, longer, of course, but since the Maidan, this has really become... Definitely. This has we really are, become central. We are showing which place we can actually take within the system. While the European Union is reconsidering its own security policy, while Russia is uh, exercising in revisionism, Ukraine is trying to offer its own place within the more broad con regional context. Okay. Well, Mikola, that's where we'll have to leave it, unfortunately, because we're out of time. But uh, thank you very, very much for coming in to speak with us. You're welcome. Thank you for watching. We've been joined by Mikola Kapitonenko. He's the director at the Center for the Study of International Relations. That's all we have time for today. Do join us again.